Hi everyone, and in our next video on this course, we will be looking at the uh, fundamental correlations within the market. Okay, um, so in the background here, we have our whiteboard, um, and we're just going to accurately kind of define and explain um, how the markets, broadly speaking, operate. Okay, so the best way to describe it in simple terms when you talk about the financial markets is it's very much like a spider's web. And the best way to, I suppose, I suppose, uh, look at that, be broadly speaking, is that when we look at all of these different um, asset classes, so we've got indices, we've got FX, we've got commodities, all of these different asset classes are related or correlated in some way, shape or form. OK, so what that means is that some are positively affected or positively correlated and some are negatively correlated. OK, so for those asset classes which are positively correlated, that will mean that when the price of one asset increases, the price of a second asset will also increase. Whereas in the, at, at the other point of view, the negative correlation means that if the price of one asset class increases, the others will decrease. So the common example here that I've actually used is the idea of the stock markets against the foreign exchange markets and I have used the indices so I've mentioned any one of these four or five different indices and their counterpart in currency so on this one here the simple example that I'm looking at it is the indice S&P 500 and the dollar example so when we look at the stock markets there's two ways to look at the markets broadly speak, speaking one is that the markets are risk on the other is that the markets is risk off so when the markets are risk on, that means there is a, a more aggressive um, risk attitude or risk profile attached from investors to the markets, broadly speaking. And when that is the case, the indices tend to increase in value. So if you look at the best example, um, theory, uh, charting example I could give is that of the stock markets from the COVID pandemic lows to the highs of 2022. What we saw was a very, very massive expansion in the markets. And as a result, the indices rallied. Now, during that time, with the aggressive risk profile that investors had, nobody, no institution, no kind of retail investor had any interest for holding dollars or holding their, their currency counterpart. And as a result, the dollar during this time weakened significantly because there was no appetite. There was no desire for investors to hold um, that asset class okay now if we fast forward at the moment what we're seeing is we're seeing the indices correct we're seeing the market sell off broadly speaking from the beginning of the year the indices are down approximately 15 to 20 percent and as a result there is a massive um uh, i suppose a sentiment or desire for investors to hold treasuries to hold dollar to hold uh cash because that is the hedge against uh, a declining stock market now i know of course people are going to say well, why should they hold the dollar if, if, if inflation is at seven and a half, eight percent? Well, what's actually happening here, they would rather have hold cash temporarily and hold that at a, at a, a negative of, of minus seven or minus eight percent against inflation than hold the indices, hold the stocks and be down 20, 25 percent. So it's all about finding the best return for investors or best return for their clients as possible and understanding how these different asset classes react off each other. So as I said there, when the stock markets are booming, you generally have higher indices. You'll have the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, just name some a few, increasing in value, increasing in strength, and you will have an underrated weakness in the dollar. Now, when the, when the, uh, the risk appetite turns and we turn to a risk off sentiment, you will generally have dollar and safe havens having a higher uh, value or they will be rallying and increasing in value. OK, that is because they're hedging their risk into safer uh, asset classes, broadly speaking. So we've also looked at some of the in the second example here, we've also looked at some of the FX currencies and how they react to the market. So broadly speaking, um, if you're looking for a weaker dollar, you're generally going to be looking for a weaker safe haven currencies. Now, as we know, the weaker safe haven currencies at the minute are the Japanese yen and Swiss franc. OK, they're the traditional safe havens. Now, with the yen, the yen at the minute has been significantly weaker despite this um, fundamental narrative because of the uh, monetary policy executed by the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan are in a very low inflation, low growth environment at the minute, despite the rest of the world having very, very high inflation figures. So therefore, at the minute, their economic policy is diverging against the other central bank um, locations. So as a result, the Japanese yen is slightly faltering against some of those other currencies in, in terms of traditional 
um, narrative. Now, of course, the Swiss franc is remaining quite strong at the moment. Okay, broadly speaking, you only have to compare it to the cable or the pound or even the euro to determine its current value. And you can even see in current weeks with the dollar weakening or with the, or the, the slight short term weakness in the dollar this week, the Swiss franc has actually picked up quite a bit of steam. So if you were to look at dollar Swiss in the chart, you would see that visibly as well. So it's important to look, to look at these kind of currencies to see what what is the underweighted, um, I suppose, value? Are they risk on or are they risk on currencies? Um, so in this other example here, when you're looking at a weaker dollar or safe haven currencies, you're also going to be looking for stronger risk on currencies. And risk on currencies, again, are one are currencies that would would be somewhat cor positively correlated with stocks and indices. Now, for that intensive purpose, these are the Aussie and the Kiwi dollar. And the reason why the Aussie and the Kiwi dollar are seen to be risk on currencies is because they export large amounts of commodities um, and they export a large amount of uh, raw materials. So you'd only have to look at um, the Aussie and the Kiwi economies to look at gold, to look at all of these minerals um, metals and other commodities, like even, for example, the Kiwi are massive exporters of milk. So all of these different commodities are seen to be more a risk aggressive approach from these currencies and as such they are seen as risk on currencies or or more aggressive risk currencies so broadly speaking if the stock markets will continue to boom higher you would generally see stronger aussie and kiwi because of the correlation in that sense now of course at the same time you also have the likes of the euro the pound the canadian dollar now again if you were to compare the dollar and the euro they too are negatively correlated okay so generally speaking when you look at the dxy um, dollar currency index, the dollar currency index is, is weighted against all of the other G7, G10 currencies. And its main weighting is in fact against the euro. So the euro actually takes up about 50% in that weighting, which basically means that the dollar is strong, the euro is weak. And if the euro is strong, the dollar is weak as well. So it's just important to be able to identify, um, to identify how these different asset classes react off each other, depending on if one is stronger or one is weaker and um, to the opposite. OK, um, same same can be said for the likes of the Canadian dollar. That is also a very, very strong risk on currency because the Canadian dollar has a massive correlation with the oil prices because the, the oil sector or the oil economy is the biggest economic output in the Canadian economy, broadly speaking. So as a direct result, if the oil prices are doing massively well and are massively high, like what we've seen in the last 18 months or so, 12 to 18 months, then the Canadian dollar, broadly speaking, is going to be strong. So you only have to look at the likes of Euro CAD, US dollar CAD, um, and some of the CAD pairs to, to to identify that, okay? So it's just important to kind of look at that. Now, so as I said there, we've, we've looked at the risk on risk off approach. So when, when we're, we're looking at the markets of selling off or the stock markets of turning lower, then you'll obviously be looking for weaker indices, so weaker stock markets, weaker Aussie, weaker Kiwi, and then you'd be looking for stronger dollar and potential safe haven. So you're obviously looking at the dollar being the primary safe haven currency, and that's because it's the global reserve currency. So we're obviously looking at how these different assets react off each other, depending on the sentiment that's currently displayed in the markets. OK, now the last one we're going to be looking at here is, of course, gold. So also when it comes to gold, yes, it is a safe haven, particularly in terms of war. So if you look at the Russia-Ukraine narrative that's been posed, the war, the invasion, what happened to gold during February and March? Gold rallied approximately $250 uh, on the end. So that's a massive, massive increase in the gold prices. And of course, that's a hedge against uncertainty. It's a hedge against volatility. And as a result, gold was taken home. Now, in, in broader markets, kind of since that's happened, gold has actually come back a little bit, which in turn means that the markets, the Aussie dollar, the Kiwi dollar, in recent months has turned lower. So with the gold prices turning lower, the Aussie and the Kiwi has actually turned lower. So normally speaking, the gold price is actually positively correlated with the Aussie and the Kiwi USD. So AUD USD and NZD USD FX pairs are positively correlated with gold. Okay, so XAU USD. So normally speaking, these can be very choppy um, depending on the circumstance or um, situational bias that's presented in the markets. And what I mean by situational bias, I mean by the event that's taking place. So if you're looking at inflation or you're looking at war, then the, the idea of holding gold becomes a little bit more of, of a buoyant viewpoint um, because of the risk, because of the uncertainty within the markets. Now, of course, there's, there's obviously two sides to every coin. And so you have to be able to look at those scenarios collectively to understand, again, is the risk, is the risk currently risk on or is the markets currently risk off? And this risk on, risk off 
happens on the weekly cycles, it happens on the monthly cycles, it happens on the quarterly cycles, but it also happens and occurs on the shorter time cycles, like your one hour, your four hour, and your daily charts as well, okay? So just a very, very useful kind of video to, I suppose, accurately explain the correlations within markets a little bit more in depth, um, so people can understand this in a clear, coherent manner. Thank you.